in the next hour, Inside the Minds. By the time I was 13 or 14, all the girls in my class were getting married, and they're getting married to people that are 30 or older. The indoctrination. Ladies, build up your husband by being submissive. Of one of the most controversial religions in America, the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the FLDS. What you hear may astonish you. How old were you when you got married? 16. How old were you when you became pregnant with your first child? 16. 16. Is there a point where religion crosses the line into mind control? April 3, 2008, the state of Texas stormed the El Dorado compound of the FLDS, the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with armored tanks and guns drawn, and began removing children who lived there. They brought in machine guns, assisted with air power and snipers. They took positions around the ranch, and they took hundreds of little children. Child Protective Services eventually separated more than 400 children from their families and from what the agency considered a potentially dangerous lifestyle. This is about children who are at imminent risk of harm, children that we believe have been abused or neglected. These little children have been terrorized. The FLDS denied the allegations and insisted their religious freedom was being trampled by the state of Texas. What the state is really saying is that, that they want to attack this whole lifestyle as abusive. The group readily admits it encourages men to take multiple wives. But the question for Texas authorities doesn't seem to be about enforcing polygamy laws. At the heart of the controversy is the age of the brides. What's being alleged is that adult men are marrying and having sex with underage girls. Some said to be as young as 14 years old. Some said to be close relatives. In the United States, we have an absolute right to believe anything you want. You cannot act on every religious belief that you have. And if one of them is statutory rape, uh, marriage to an underage girl, uh, or just general physical or sexual abuse, it's illegal. The FLDS doesn't deny there may be incidents of abuse, like in all parts of society. But they deny that it's systematic. By removing all of the children, by defining the household unit as the ranch rather than the family unit, I think that they've vastly overreached in terms of, of uh, removing children from an, an environment. I also think that the basis upon which they moved in here and the way that it was done was completely inappropriate. I think any time you have a few thousand people in a community, somebody's going to do something bad like that. That is the nature of human beings. There will be some child abuse, there will be some domestic violence and other kinds of bad conduct. That doesn't make it representative of the community. It makes it the kind of bad conduct that we need to police. We were told that our children have been abused and none of them have been abused. Those children have been traumatized so much. The case went all the way to the Texas Supreme Court where ultimately, with the support of the American Civil Liberties Union, the FLDS triumphed. Nearly two months after the raid, it was ruled that child welfare officials had no right to take those kids away, which means the children of the FLDS were allowed to go home. But to what? The women of the FLDS describe their community as heaven on earth, a place where they're promised eternal salvation. They say they're not abused housewives forced into loveless marriages as teenagers. What they cherish more than anything, they say, is their children. We love our children, and they love us. How could they love us if we abused them? But some who have either been kicked out or chose to leave the religion tell a starkly different story. One that goes beyond the polygamy, they say, into a lifestyle defined by abuse and an intense program of mental indoctrination. It's possible that both sides are telling the truth, that they simply view the same set of circumstances differently, that one person's strict religious upbringing is another person's brainwashing. 
So where is the line between religion and mind control? An attorney representing the FLDS declined our request for an interview for this story. We did speak to several former members of the group. Growing up in the FLDS, we were not to be noticed. We were not to make ourselves attractive. We were not to be anything but submissive, subservient, and make babies. And raise them right so they stayed in the religion. Rena Mackard was born and raised in an FLDS family. She says her father had four wives and 27 children. As a teenager, she says she was assigned by the group's spiritual leadership to marry one of her stepbrothers. They had three children, divorced, and she was then assigned to marry a man 30 years her senior. When she refused, she says she was excommunicated and forced to leave her children behind. My family was told I was dead, to never speak my name. I was not their sister. My mother looked me in the eye and told me it would have been better for her if I'd never been born. It is very, very difficult for a polygamist woman to leave the organization. They put boys out uh, because they want to reduce the male population to enable them to have more wives assigned to each man. Rena fought hard to get her children back. Eleven months later, she succeeded. Neither she nor her children ever returned to the FLDS. But for women like Rena, leaving means more than physically getting away. They say it means breaking the powerful mental grip of mind control to which they've been subjected. The women that leave the FLDS are labeled as apostates, traitors. They have turned against God. They will be condemned on earth and in heaven. They will be separated in eternal darkness alone. The threat of damnation is a potent weapon. But it wasn't enough to keep Flora Jessup inside. My life was chaos and fear and pain. And I got to a point when I lived within the FLDS where I didn't only hate myself, I hated my dad, I hated my mom. At the same time, I loved them. I wanted to be safe, but you never do get safe. The pain just never stops. Flora was raised in an FLDS home. Growing up, she desperately wanted to run away. But she says her family had other ideas. They walled off the end of a hallway in my uncle's home where I spent three years in solitary confinement with them trying to beat Satan out of me. One of the things my aunt used to love to do was beat the bottoms of my feet with a cane. If you couldn't walk, you couldn't run. If you couldn't run, you couldn't escape. By the age of 16, she'd had enough. I ran for my life. I was married at 16 and stayed in the marriage for three weeks, and then I ran. And I hitchhiked back and forth across the United States for five years. Flora stopped running when she got pregnant with her daughter. She still carried the baggage of the FLDS, and eventually she decided to fight back against the group by freeing other young women who believe they were trapped there. So far, Flora says she has rescued more than 80 women and children. Two of them were Fawn Broadbent and Fawn Holm. In 2004, KTVK senior reporter Mike Watkins was there to record the rescue for his documentary, Colorado City and the Underground Railroad. Anti-polygamy activist Flora Jessup heading for a rendezvous with two teenage girls. Let's go get my kids. A couple of 16-year-olds who have run away from their families in Colorado City and now say they don't want to go back. I don't want to become some 50-year-old man's wife or something like that. The two girls' best friends who share the same first name, Fawn Holm and Fawn Broadbent, on the run and hiding out at a safe house on the outskirts of Laverkin, Utah. And it's here in the middle of the night the two teenagers place their fates in the hands of a woman they've never met hoping for a future outside of Colorado City and away from the practice of polygamy. You can't talk to boys. That's my it's like room. really wicked. You can't like do anything, can't watch movies or TV or anything. You can't dress like you want to. We've always been told that people out here were wicked. And I don't believe everyone is wicked. Shall I tell you a secret? Something that I found out when I left? It's true, we're all wicked. <laughs> but we're not as wicked as them. 
I do believe that it's terrorism hiding behind um, the skirt of religion. I also believe that it's a criminal organization and it is founded on the exploitation and abuse of children. The FLDS has thousands of members. Only a handful of former members seem to speak out against the church on a regular basis. Are their stories representative of a larger problem within the FLDS? Or, as in the rest of society, are there bound to be some cases of abuse? Up next, plural marriage means many wives with a mission to procreate. They have an abundance of ovulation test kits that they get in bulk, and the women are to find out when they're fertile. There was many officers and SWAT team around in buses, and they were very, very frightened. Just what is the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the FLDS? What do they believe, and how do they pass those beliefs down from generation to generation? The group split off from Mormonism in the late 19th century over the issue of polygamy. Mormons renounce the practice. Fundamentalists believe the more wives a man takes, the closer he gets to God. FLDS members tend to live in isolated compounds like Colorado City on the Arizona-Utah border. The group was largely left alone for generations until 2003 when one of its members was convicted of bigamy and sexual abuse of a minor. That's when the group's self-proclaimed prophet, Warren Jeffs, bought more than a thousand acres of land in Texas and began building a new home base. Law enforcement was starting to investigate much more seriously uh, the activities in Colorado City and in Helldale, where the faith is based, so he knew it wasn't necessarily safe. That's why he went underground. I believe his intention was to cherry pick the cream of the, the crop of the most faithful. I think he was just slowly trying to build his, his Zion, his, his kingdom. Warren took the most faithful and moved them down there. They are the ones who would never turn their backs and never betray him. He thought he would be much safer in Texas than in Utah or Arizona. The yearning for Zion Ranch is nearly 50 miles from the nearest city and is extremely secluded. According to former FLDS member Rena Mackert, that's no accident. The idea, she says, is to cut off information into and out of the compound. She says this isolation makes it easier to enforce strict adherence to FLDS doctrine and discourage any questioning about the group or its leaders. They control everything in everyone's lives. They control what they eat, what they can or can't drink, how they dress, how they do their hair, whether the men can have facial hair, what what's acceptable and what's not. They are truly a cult. Rick Ross has been studying cults since the early 1980s and closely watching the FLDS since the early 1990s. He says the group has about 12,000 members and exhibits some cult-like characteristics. For example, he says cults isolate and control their members foster an us-versus-them attitude about the outside world, make it difficult for members to leave, and demonize those who do leave. The FLDS would be comparable to groups called cults in the way in which they manipulate and control the members of the organization. Uh, when I say that, I'm talking about control of the environment, control of communication, uh, control of information. If you can control everything that goes into the mind, you can control the mind. But attorney Ken Driggs, a Mormon who has written about the FLDS, disagrees. I do not see them as a cult. I do see them as non-traditionally religious. I do see them as people attempting to live their religion but kind of outside of the mainstream society. They recognize that there are tensions between the kinds of practices and customs in mainstream society and the way they want to live and they want to retreat to the lifestyle that they think is important. Good morning to everyone. The FLDS bristles at the idea that it's a cult or that its women are victims of oppression or mind control. 
These FLDS mothers, appearing on NBC's Today Show 13 days after their children were taken away in the April 3rd raid, insist their freedom hasn't been curtailed at all. There is no force in our work. It's all choice. Everyone's allowed to choose. Could it be that our modern American take on things just keeps us from understanding who these people really are? Forensic psychologist N.G. Burrell has not met these women. His comments are based on their interview. He attributes at least some of the group's problems to a conflict of cultures. How could they love us if we abuse them? This, this, yeah, this is... I think this is... This, right, right, right here is the crux of the entire situation. It's, it's how you define a uh, cult, it's how you define normal, it's what you define as abuse and not abuse. From their perspective, I have no doubt that what went on in terms of the conduct between adult males and their adolescent daughters um, was not abuse, from their perspective. I, I have my children, and they, they mean a lot to me. It's not that this was sort of a, a, a wanton sex orgy. I don't think that that's what was going on. But it's about fundamental beliefs and the beliefs that are out of line with the rest of the culture. So if a woman is willing to obey the strict FLDS doctrine of submitting to men and allowing her daughters to marry young as she herself likely did, isn't she just practicing her religion, her constitutional right? Or, as the state of Texas originally alleged, is she enabling her daughter to be the victim of child sexual abuse, all in the name of God? The women have to hand over their children in order for the men to abuse them in this organization. What they would say is that this is how they've been raised, this is what they've been taught, and it's true. There is a cycle of abuse that creates the organization that they are. Uh, it doesn't give them an excuse for their behavior, but this is what's been done with this, within this group for over a hundred years. When we come back, it may surprise you to hear how a 14-year-old girl can view her destiny to become a plural wife. I knew that I probably wouldn't be a first wife. I might get lucky and be a first wife, but even if that were the case, then there would be others to come. The music we listened to was priesthood music. The books that we read were sermons. Um, a lot of our time, we sat out under a, a big tree we had in our backyard sewing, you know, by hand, maybe some little doll dresses. For Kathy Jo Nicholson and for many girls, the FLDS was an idyllic existence, a safe haven from an evil world. One of 13 siblings, Kathy Jo was raised by her father and three mothers in Sandy City, Utah. From an early age, like all FLDS children, she was taught to obey the prophet and never to question the group's doctrine. Among other things, she was told marriage was her only path to heaven and that the group's spiritual leader, the prophet Leroy Johnson, was an immortal god. And she believed. It was just a very religious environment, very strict. We got up in the morning and we knelt and we said prayer. The art that we could have on the wall was either a quote from the prophet or from books or sermons of former prophets. If Kathy Jo or anyone inside the FLDS community showed frustration with the rules, they were simply reminded to keep sweet. Keep sweet means keep your mouth shut and follow the program or we'll crush you. That's what keep sweet means. This mantra of keeping sweet, it's basically if you don't toe the line and keep this, this smile on your face and do exactly what the prophet or your father or your priesthood head tells you to do, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna come down on you like a load of bricks. Keep sweet was our just the standard that we lived by. It was a way to rein us back in, to um, snuff out any kind of emotions we may feel. Much was expected of the FLDS flock, but as this Warren Jeff sermon shows, most of the burden fell on the women. Many young men, when they receive their first wife, are just so untrained. And the woman, if she's not careful, will be overbearing and always ask permission for what she wants and ladies build up your husband by being submissive that's how you will give your children the success you will want your children to be obedient and submissive to righteous living 
The woman's role in the FLDS is to serve her priesthood head, raise her, bear children. Um, that's a, a huge part. There is no belief in, in birth control and within the community they, they have an abundance of ovulation test kits that they get in bulk and the women are to find out when they're um, fertile and they, the husband would be theirs for those, for those nights so that they could procreate. According to Kathy Joe, all marriages were arranged by the prophet and she says a girl could be called to the altar as soon as she reached puberty. So in 1985, at age 14, Kathy Jo began preparing for her own celestial wedding. I began sewing my wedding dress at the age of 14. I had a very romanticized fairy tale of what, how it was going to be. I, I knew that I probably wouldn't be a first wife, but even if that were the case, then there would be others to come. As a teenager, Kathy Jo attended Alta Academy, an FLDS-only school, where then-principal Warren Jeffs was a central figure. We just worshipped him. He could be very charismatic and very loving. There was even a period in my life when I thought that I, I, it would be a privilege to be one of his wives. Jeffs was so intent on developing young minds to eagerly follow FLDS teachings, Kathy Jo says they learned little else. We learned the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic. However, we didn't get a glimpse, not even a glimpse of um, world history or, you know, science. Jeffs even taught his students that this never happened. It's one small step for man. Kathy Joe says FLDS doctrine held that God set aside the moon and the planets for the faithful in the afterlife. So the idea that NASA beat them to it was simply unacceptable. Kathy Jo believed Jeffs and continued making her wedding dress. But as she sewed, she began having serious doubts about plural marriage, the backbone of FLDS teachings. And I thought, wait a minute, what if I'm not happy? What if, what if I can't have kids? What if my husband doesn't like me? And I just, I just started to get terrified because I could be called at any moment. And I think that's probably part of the impetus behind me getting more rebellious so that no one would want me. Kathy Jo stopped keeping sweet and started acting out. Jeffs had no tolerance for those who strayed from his teachings, and his ever-watchful eye soon focused in on Kathy Jo. I had my little ways of, of maybe wearing my hair a little bit looser, sneaking a little makeup, and it caused disruption. He wanted people in that school to focus on priesthood matters. You know, we were all young teens and raging um, hormones, and I wanted to be unique and cute. In 1986, Jeffs expelled Kathy Jo from school for passing a note to a boy. But she didn't really lose faith until the group's prophet, Leroy Johnson, died. When he died, um, I was 15 turning 16. We were told he would never die. We would be lifted up with him and I felt so blessed. And it just really crumbled and it just, you know, it really was the the end for me. Against everything she'd ever been taught, Kathy Jo began sharing her doubts with an FLDS man who was also questioning the faith. Within a year, in a break from the church, they got married without the blessing of the new prophet, Rulon Jeffs. Shortly after, they moved to California. There was no harrowing escape, just the courage to leave behind her family, her friends, and everything she'd ever known. Never once in my life have I considered going back. I missed my family, I missed my friends. I kept in touch with them for a long time. I also had a nagging fear at the back of my head um, that maybe they'd come get me. Like many who leave the FLDS, life on the outside was hard for Kathy Jo. She struggled with substance abuse and depression. She got divorced. The reason I began my substance abuse is because the emptiness was so vast and as I started to get over the excitement of the new newness I was alone all alone it wasn't until Kathy Jo became a single mother that she stopped doing drugs today 20 years after leaving the FLDS she's happily remarried with two children 
and she has a new perspective on her former life. What she once thought was a strict upbringing now seems much more sinister. The members of the FLDS are programmed and they are brainwashed systematically, day in and day out. Um, it's done by isolation, it's done by indoctrination, it's done by um, physical abuse, sexual abuse. In 2005, Kathy Jo founded Out of Polygamy, a not-for-profit organization that aims to educate the public about the FLDS. Don't mistake this for a religion. This is a, a group of people who have the power to abuse, and they are abusing. The FLDS denies systematically marrying off underage brides. Up next, one young woman's story. Ruth, how old were you when you got married? Phoenix TV reporter Mike Watkins has been covering the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or FLDS, for the last 15 years. He's so outraged by the group and its alleged domination and oppression of women, he calls it America's Taliban. He even made a documentary about it on his own time and his own dime, Colorado City and the Underground Railroad. In it, he tells the story of baby-faced teenager Ruth Stubbs. At the age of 16, Ruth was given as a so-called plural wife to a 32-year-old polygamous man who already had two wives and nearly 20 children. A man by the name of Rodney Holm, a guy who also just happens to be a sworn officer on Colorado City's police force. Ruth, how old were you when you got married? 16. 16 years old. How old were you when you became pregnant with your first child? 16. 16. I've always thought that Ruth Stubbs is the, uh, the Rosa Parks of this human rights revolution. She came out of Colorado City at the age of 19 back in 2002. She has two little babies with her, a third on the way, and suddenly she's down, she's running. She was given as the third wife to a 32-year-old police officer. One of his wives was Ruth's older sister. Watkins aggressively pursues Holm as the polygamist and his attorney leave a Phoenix court appearance in 2002. My name is Mike Watkins. I'm a reporter here in I, Phoenix. I know who you are, sir. Do you? Yeah. I'd like to ask you about uh, this proceeding we just witnessed. Apparently you're married to three women. Now, Mr. Holm has gone to court to get access to his children. He's going to tell his story to a judge uh -huh. where decisions can be made. He doesn't want to make his children the subject of some kind of media circus. I understand and with that, that, we're not going to say anything else but today. My understanding is that you are a we're police done officer. For today. We're done for today, sir. sir. Thank you. In August 2003, Holm was convicted of three felony counts of bigamy and sexual misconduct with a minor. The upshot, Ruth got custody of her children. Rod Holm served one year in jail, and the FLDS and its newly self-proclaimed prophet, Warren Steed Jeffs, ended up under the government's microscope. It was that moment that Warren Jeff said, we're in trouble here. If they can come and get a polygamous cop follower of mine and throw him in jail, it's only a matter of time before they come after me. I would argue that that was the one time that the prophet Warren Jeffs was actually prophetic because he knew that they were going to come after him. Sure enough, beginning in 2005, the law turned its attention on FLDS leader Warren Jeffs. I will say the prayers to begin with. Close your eyes, close your eyes. Charging him with a series of sex crimes in Arizona and Utah. Among them, forcing a 14-year-old girl to marry and have sex with her 19-year-old first cousin. Jeffs went on the run and was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Here's Jeffs kissing a girl, alleged to be a 12-year-old child bride. The shot reportedly taken while he was on the run. Well, he had people all over the Southwest who were willing to take him in and keep him underground. I mean, they gave him food, they gave him money, and they gave him cell phones. You know, he, he called them hiding houses, and, and he would stash women in these various places and just say, you wait, 
stay there until I show up and, you know, bless you or do whatever I want to do with you, deliver a sermon, have sex and go on down the road. Warren Jeffs was captured during a routine traffic stop near Las Vegas, Nevada in August 2006. Mr. Jeffs, you will be committed to the custody of the sheriff to be transported to the Department of Corrections. One year later, Jeffs was tried in Utah and found guilty of two counts of rape by accomplice. He is now serving a minimum of 10 years in a Utah state prison. I think that he had too much power, too quick, and it ate him alive and destroyed his soul. When nobody's looking, when nobody's watching, when nobody's protecting children, guys like Warren Jeffs emerge, and I hope that that's the lesson. But Watkins says women rarely turn against their husbands or the group. Trained from an early age to be submissive and obedient, most young FLDS women with little education and almost no real concept of the outside world are said not to question their place. Is this just a set of religious teachings? Or can it be considered mind control? Or is it something else entirely? I would call it a sort of social indoctrination. Maybe that's another way of looking at it. Uh, In-group, out-group mentality. It's been suggested sometimes that because the women are quite deferential and may uh, hesitate a little bit to engage in conversation with strangers and things like that, that that's evidence that there is some sort of mind control, that they've been brainwashed to not do this. I don't see that at all. We've heard what the girls were taught in the FLDS. Up next, what about the boys? When I was growing up, I was taught to treat girls like rattlesnakes because if you uh, commit fornication or adultery you go straight to hell the images and stories of the women and girls of the FLDS have been alarming questions of forced marriages pregnant teens and sexual abuse have put the spotlight on a religious sect used to living in seclusion I have my children and they they mean a lot to me but if the women and girls are being portrayed as systematic victims of abuse and mind control, what about the men and boys? I've heard a lot of horror stories that girls being actually raped on their wedding night by, by the men that were, because they're told and they're taught that once they're given to a man, that he, they are his property. And so he can do with them what he, he wants to do, and, and he does. And that's the way he's brought up as well. According to former FLDS member Carl Holm, the hierarchy of the group goes like this. The prophet comes first, and the men are expected to be subservient to him. In turn, the men are rulers of their own households, expecting nothing short of full obedience from their wives and children. Sometimes I knew that my father was wrong for the things that he did. And I'd go talk to my mom about it, and I'd try to, and she would tell me straight, straight up, that's your father, I'm not going to talk to you about that because your father is, he's my husband, and he's, he's your priest of the head, and it, what he says is the way it's going to be. Holmes says he was willing to respect the strict hierarchy until the prophet, Warren Jeffs, began marrying off girls under the age of 18. You're actually marrying a child. I brought up four daughters of my own, and... I can't imagine me marrying them off at younger than 18. I mean, even at 18, I, I think they should wait. I've spoken with people in the community, and, you know, these are not unintelligent people. You know, they're, they're bright, they're industrious, they're very hardworking, they're good at business. Stephen Singular interviewed a number of FLDS members while writing When Men Become Gods, a book about Warren Jeffs and the FLDS. But... It, when it comes to that matter of uh, controlling your soul, you know, controlling your destiny, your life here and your next life, they were trained to believe that this one individual, this prophet, held all the power and all the answers. Members of the FLDS consider the prophet to be a messenger from God. Disagreeing with him is said to be nearly impossible. Any man who did go against the prophet or somehow displeased him could lose everything. He made 21 of the most prominent men in the community stand up. And as they stood there, he instantly excommunicated them from the church. He just threw them out. And, you know, you're gone, and uh, your, your wives and families will go to other people. 
It's one thing to run afoul of the prophet and his teachings as a grown man, but in many cases, young boys have had their problems towing the FLDS line. When I was growing up, I was taught to treat girls like rattlesnakes because you're not supposed to associate with them or have anything to do with them because if you uh, commit fornication or adultery, you go straight to hell. So, But I was still interested in girls, obviously. So, <laughs> Simon Barlow grew up in Colorado City, Arizona and went to Alta Academy during the tightly controlled reign of Warren Jeffs. Among the rules, no radio, no TV, no novels. They had a saying called uh, pray and obey. So pretty much everybody's supposed to be submissive. And that's kind of the reason the, the young boys get kicked out is because they're boys and they ain't always going to do what they're told. According to Simon, independent thinkers got into trouble while the obedient were promised wives and a chance at heaven. That's what he expected for himself, but that's not how it worked out. I grew up expecting to get married when I was probably 21, 22, but then by the time I was 13 or 14, all the girls in my class were getting married. And so that's when I started questioning whether I really wanted to be there or not, because these are friends and stuff, you know, that I knew, and they're getting married to people that are 30 or older. Simon left school after eighth grade and went to work at a dairy farm outside the community. That's where he began to drift away from Jeff's and FLDS teachings. He listened to the radio, went to movies, and stayed out late until he got caught. My stepdad asked me if I was going to quit going to the movies and doing bad stuff like that. I was like, I'll oh, probably happen again. <laughs> and then I said, as a matter of fact, I don't really want to go to church anymore either. And at that point, I guess, he decided that I would be a bad influence to my younger brothers. So he said, pack up all your stuff and get it out of the house by Monday, or it's going to be on the street. At age 17, Simon joined the ranks of the so-called Lost Boys, the name given to the group of underage boys who left or were kicked out of the FLDS. Imagine taking a 14 or 15 year old kid and saying, here, you're on your own with nothing. You know, you didn't really have an education. You didn't have resources. And there are estimates of a thousand of these boys uh, leaving the community, ending up on the streets of St. George or Salt Lake or Las Vegas and having to fend for themselves. I mean, there are only so many women to go around in these situations, and every boy was a potential competitor with an older man. We just got rid of them. I mean, obviously, there have been some of those kids. Uh, I don't think they are nearly the numbers that are sometimes held out. I don't think the issue is competition for brides. I've never seen it that way, partly because I have seen a lot of monogamous households who were intent on staying monogamous in that community. Like some other lost boys, with little family support and a newfound freedom, Simon says he abused drugs and ran afoul of the law. It took nearly five years for him to learn to set his own limits. In that time, he's come to see the FLDS in a whole new light. I really didn't think about it as brainwashing or mind control until after I left the community. And I didn't realize how weird it was. And the longer I've been away from there, the more messed up it seemed to me. Today, Simon wants what a lot of young men want, to go to college, find a good job, and get married. But there's one thing he isn't searching for. I don't think I'll ever join another religion just because I don't think I'd ever believe it. I mean, I, there's always going to be people that are going to try and take advantage of you through religion. I will say the prayer to begin with. Up next, a former member fears for the children of the FLDS now that they're back home. What we've experienced in Utah and Arizona for so many years is being helped for a split second and then being returned back to the abuse. And that's even worse than if they never came in. We've had little children. When you see them, you will see the terror and you will see the effect that this has had on them. They've had them where they wouldn't eat. They haven't been able to sleep. They've been through an absolute terror of an experience. 
Beginning Monday, June 2nd, after nearly two months in foster homes across Texas, the children of the FLDS were allowed to reunite with their parents with some court-ordered conditions, a ban on travel outside of Texas, surprise home visits by caseworkers, and possible psychiatric evaluations of their children. There still may be criminal indictments against members of the group. For its part, the FLDS released a statement announcing a new church-wide policy. The church policies regarding marriage have been widely misrepresented and misunderstood. In the future, the church commits that it will not preside over any marriage of any woman under the age of legal consent in the jurisdiction in which the marriage takes place. But ex-member Flora Jessup remains as concerned for the children now as she was when the story first broke back in April. When I heard that the raid had happened in Texas, the thing that went through me was joy, absolute joy, and then fear, immediately followed by fear, because what we've experienced in Utah and Arizona for so many years is being helped for a split second and then being returned back to the abuse, and that's even worse than if they never came in. There are other issues. As the FLDS moves on to its next chapter, one of the problems it faces stems from decades of inbreeding that have gone on within the group. A rare genetic disease called fumarase deficiency, which causes acute mental retardation and physical deformities from birth, has stricken at least 20 children in the FLDS. Outside the group, there are only an estimated 100 cases in the world. I think it's already well established that when you have a couple of clans and you inbreed for several generations, you know, you're going to have some genetic deficiencies and genetic problems. You hear the same names over and over again in polygamy, Jessup's, Allred, uh, Jeff's, and so on. The, the genetic pool that these people are operating within is so limited that they have diseases that, that reflect the intermarriage between these same families over generations. All of these issues surrounding how FLDS members live their lives and why they choose to live them that way bring it back to the basic question. Is there a point when strict adherence to a set of religious beliefs begins to resemble mind control? There may never be a consensus. So where does all of that leave the FLDS? The question now is, will the government allow the system to continue, regardless of who it hurts, or will this be the end of it? I'm still trying to get through the fog, and I'm very concerned about those children. Right now, that's first and foremost. They've recently bought more land in Colorado in order to maybe set up a new compound. They have several other compounds around the West, and I think they're going to be repopulated. I don't have any doubt that it will survive. It'll probably come out of this thing stronger than it has been in the past. The bad thing is I think they are going to be more reclusive. They are going to be driven more underground. It's going to take a couple of generations before they're going to be ready to trust the outside world and engage with the outside world again. For FLDS church elder Willie Jessup, it all comes down to what he sees as an unnecessary assault on his group and its religious freedom by the state of Texas. You know, they didn't find, and they'll never find, a justification to tear people and a community apart. 